Good morning, everyone, and welcome. A um, couple of housekeeping things first. Um, during the communion, I will give the prayer for both the bread and the wine, then do the combined prayer, and then we'll come up in an orderly fashion and take our bread and wine and then go back to our seats. Um, so that's kind of the only weird thing about that. So, so we'll come up the outsides and then gather your things and then go back to the center. So you'll exit to the sides, up front, back. Yeah. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I did not prepare this service. That was to the uh, efforts of Dorothy, or not Dorothy, um, Debbie Rushfeld, Rushfeld, or Debbie, Dorothy Rushfeld. Um, 
So she did all the work for this, so I appreciate that. Um, Robin has an announcement that she is eagerly waiting to share with everyone. I'm just chomping at the bit. Can you tell? Okay. Christmas gifts due next week. So if if you um, are at a loss as to wanting to know what to get, there are some suggestions in this handout and they are on the table back there. So please, um, please go shopping this week and um, suggestions are in here. And also, pardon me? Also in the newsletter. So thank you. Nadine was also excited to share, not quite as much as Robin. But she's very eager to. So I don't usually do this, and um, yet I need your help. So I'm going to kind of do a little bragging. I have a group of students that have uh, reached an incredible accomplishment, and um, we've been participating in. The Battle of the Brains, which is sponsored by Burns and McDonald's here in the Kansas City area. And 750 proposals were turned into them. I had three. And last Thursday, outside of my school front door, a, a van pulled up, bubbles were being blown, bazookas and everything were, <laughs> I don't know, it was a crazy morning. And um, my team, one of my teams had made the top 20. So thank you. I'm super proud of them. Um, this is to create an exhibit at Science City in downtown. And um, the topic my kids picked was uh, pollution solution, green energy, um, and coming up with new ways that we can do things. Um, so they're in a, now a competition for public support. So this is mainly why I'm here. Um, in the next two weeks, there's going to be public voting for all the 20 top choices. And I would love if you would go each morning for the next two weeks and vote for a green idea, a pollution solution. Um, and I will make sure that the um, website is available. It's the abbreviations of Battle of the Brain, B-O-T-B um, dot com slash backslash vote but i'll make sure that that is posted somewhere but it, you can only use your email account you can't use all your devices you can only use email accounts so if you have multiple email accounts you can vote multiple times so we'll take any vote we can get and we ask you to share that with everybody all my seven fifth graders would greatly appreciate um moving up into the top five and possibly getting their exhibit built at science city so Help me out, help them out. We would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Nadine. That mm -hmm. sounds very exciting. Our speaker this morning, our, our speaker this morning, I know kind of well. Um, I, I will introduce Jennifer, our speaker this morning, who um, went to Dorothy Moody and um, is very funny. Um, we, I have two friends of mine who have done stand up and we're very accomplished in Kansas City and so both of them won contests here and read for uh, agents in California and didn't want to move to California, but uh, they we did um, back in the 90s, a thing called comedy sports and Jen was on a team and my two friends were on an opposing team and when um, we would talk about that. Chris's dad would always say, you guys are funny, but that girl that was on that other team, she was really funny. You know, forget about how funny you guys are. That's the real funny. So um, they bring that up all the time. Yeah. Um, our scripture this morning, go right into that with a bad segue, is Isaiah. And uh, it's about, it's basically, the coach trying to pump up the team. They just got some, a bad prophecy, a negative prophecy, 
that said that Babylon was going to come in and take over Israel. And then they're given this little pep talk. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, says your God. Proclaim from the wilderness, because they were in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight a highway for God. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go high up on the mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. He tends to, he tends to his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries, carries them close to his heart. It's the first Sunday of Advent and Advent means um, to come. Jesus is coming. And this is the preparation for that we use to get ready for a season of goodwill, a season of loving one another. And it's, um, I don't know, it's a, everybody loves the Christmas season. Yesterday, uh, we went to a parade that was all horse-drawn. Every participant in the parade, you guys hear that feedback? was either on a horse or being pulled by a horse-drawn carriage. And it, it was just a great way for us as a family to kick off the Christmas season. Santa came through on, in his big uh, carriage, I guess that's what it's called. Um, it wasn't a covered wagon, but it was a big, you know, it was exciting to see Santa and to see The streets filled with people. Preparing the way of the Lord. I don't know why this is so emotional, but um, as we enter Advent these next few weeks, think about how we prepare ourselves in the little things that we do that are very normal that are are decorating your tree decorating your house going to a parade and think about the the way that that gets your soul ready for christmas so let's go to our opening hymn number 409 that's the words will be up here
Dear Lord, help us to realize the Advent story in history is a story for our lives right now, a story of hope and mystery, anticipation, preparation, a kingdom of this world and the next, and a king appearing when we least expect. It's heaven touching the earth, the footsteps of the divine walking dusty roads, a savior, a people searching for a savior and walking past a stable. Open our eyes and our hearts that this advent of hope is for the world. Amen. The music that um, Charles just played is the tune to this, the one verse that we want to sing after Larry and I finish with the reading. So uh, you can stay seated for that, but I think he's going to play the last line of it and then pause so then we'll know to start singing. So today we're going to relight the first Advent candle, the hope candle. And it represents the hope that we have in Jesus. And now we will light the candle for the second Sunday in Advent. This is the candle of love. Jesus demonstrated self-giving love in his ministry as the Good Shepherd. Advent is a time for kindness, thinking of others, and sharing with others. It is a time to love as God loved us by giving us his most precious gift. As God is love, let us love all. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find these words. For the love of our God is God of gods and the Lord of lords. The great God, mighty and awesome, who has not partial and takes no bribes, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them you shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. From the Gospel of John we hear, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Let us pray. Teach us to love, O oh Lord. Thank you for teaching us how to be loving. Your love help us to be a reflection of you as we create sacred communities. May we be diligent in our work towards peace. May we always remember to put you first as we follow Christ's footsteps, that we may know your love and show it in our lives as we prepare for our celebration of Jesus' birth also fill our hearts with love for the world, that all may know your love and the one whom you have sent, your Son, our Savior. Amen.
God of love, thank you for teaching us how to be loving and peaceful. We are grateful for your unending action, guiding humanity towards peace on earth. Bring love to us in our oppression. With love, heal our pain and suffering. Through love, help us to be a reflection of you as we create sacred community. May we be diligent in our work toward peace. Just as a chef prepares each course, a gardener tills the soil, and a parent nurtures the heart of a child, all is done with loving intention. In the name of your son, Jesus, the one we wait for and our example of love, amen. Good morning. I will share with you our, um, our main scripture for this morning. It's from the book of Malachi, chapter three. And in the first part, this is, um, this is God talking. I think you would figure that out, but just a heads up. See, I will send my messenger who I will prepare. Sorry, let me start over. See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And then this is the author Malachi speaking. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have seen men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. This is the season of Advent. So it's fitting that our scripture states that God is coming to it's preparing us God is coming as a baby in Bethlehem the coming to us the preparation is filled with joy with Christmas parades with decorating our houses joyful blessings right this is a bold prophetic announcement. And Advent is a time when we traditionally tell the story of the birth of Jesus. Interestingly, the book of Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Literally, if I turn the page, one page in my Bible from our scripture today, if I turn one page, we hear the new story of John the Baptist on the very next page. In, in Matthew. The name Malachi means messenger, specifically my messenger. That means your messenger. The passage suggests that the Messiah will come suddenly, alerting us to be prepared. And then following that, as you heard, there were some abrupt questions. And you know, I haven't heard the scripture that many times. So when I read it and reread it, it was a little bit different sounding to me. That's not part of our normal Christmas story. Yet the words in the scripture, some of you may know, are um, part of the lyrics in Handel's Messiah. So that is. Um, probably commonly known by choral people. But these questions are not distinctly what we think of as glad tidings. There's definitely something different in this Advent message, this particular message. And the two questions are, who can endure and who can stand? Who can endure this coming? who can stand and say they're ready. In other words, this is trying to remind us 
to reflect on ourselves. And how fitting, right? We, are, we have our table prepared. Do you see yourself as ready? Typically, our preparation for the season is fixing delicious food, attending lighting ceremonies. Personally, I often end up on Christmas Day um, feeling a combination of relief, you know, and part of it is being a mom of four kids and, and you know, our family has always had such joy and excitement and preparation. And so that day is a feeling of relief and, and hardly a peaceful feeling sometimes, you know, I have to work to find that. But it is the beautiful things that we love and think about. God's words in this announcement, in this prophetic announcement, can be both comforting and disturbing. They're supposed to be. It can comfort those who are disturbed and it can disturb those who are comforted. Kind of classic Old Testament God, right? Kind of classic. To be prepared for Jesus coming, you know, it's not a passive experience. It's we do all these active things on the outside, but if we forget to do the active things on the inside, then we're missing the point of this scripture today. It requires discipline. When I was a little kid, no, I wasn't a little kid. When I was a young adult, you wouldn't have believed me if I would have said. I, I loved Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I, I, not when I was a kid. Um, I loved the requirements that he enlisted. I loved the, he, I read his books. They were all about Christian discipline, Christian discipleship. I loved that. I, I kind of ate it up. I liked looking at myself. I liked self-reflection. I, I wanted to repent. All of that stuff, that all of the lists of things, the requirements to be a Christian um, were uh, really part of my makeup as a young adult. Not that it's not now, it's just different. You know, you change and you evolve and your way of reflecting and repenting is different. But I was, I was kind of a literalist as a young adult. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer was perfect for me. Um, and that's, he wrote sermons on this very scripture, multiple. And that doesn't surprise me because he, he lifted out the part of Advent that focuses on true preparation as a Christian disciple. Verse three indicates the need for purity and these images are offered of soap and cleansing and the refiner's fire and you picture a silversmith and this is, this is God. The part that I think is interesting and noteworthy too, the fact that God sees in us our need for cleansing. God is the only one who can see all of my dirt and all of my deepest issues and my deepest fears and my biggest tears. And the point of this is that out of sheer love, God sees our darkest moments and ritualistically over the course of four weeks cleanses us and refines us. There can be pain involved in this. And this is why in the scripture, there's an element of he's coming and that's our joy. He's coming, get ready. But also be careful what you wish for kind of a thing. We are as close literarily to being washed by John the Baptist as we can possibly be. One page turning. Today's scripture calls us to do the inner work of examining the state of our souls. This is a poem. I always read from this book in December. Jane, if you're out there, I'm doing my thing. 
This is um, Ann Weems. In each heart lies a Bethlehem, an inn where we must ultimately answer whether there is room or not. When we are Bethlehem bound, we experience our own advent in his. When we are Bethlehem bound, we can no longer look the other way, conveniently not seeing stars, not hearing angel voices. We can no longer excuse ourselves by tending our sheep or our kingdoms. This advent, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that the Lord has made known to us. In the midst of shopping sprees, let's ponder in our hearts the gift of gifts. Through the tinsel, let's look for the gold of the Christmas star. In the excitement and confusion, in the merry chaos, let's listen for the brush of angels' wings. This Advent, let's go to Bethlehem and find our kneeling places. Christ seeks to enter our lives every moment of every day, for God so loved the world. His love is infinite. Human love is different. Human love this is the love Sunday. I'm always interested to know which one I'll get. I like the love one. I don't think I've had love before. But as humans, love is only, it only functions in the present moment. The existence of love is always only right now. It's really contemplative to think about. And we've learned over time that humans require love Babies require love to survive. They can have physical needs met. If they don't have love, they still can't survive. For those of us who have had lives filled with love, it's hard to imagine any life without it. But I also see that love has many deterrents and blocks and barriers, excuse me, barriers. And you know, we see that all around us, particularly now in our society. Many times over the years in working in an inner city hospital, I've had the opportunity to care for patients, and I've talked about this before. Um, a lot of people who are perpetrators of street violence or who have been involved in other forms of domestic violence or have severe mental illness. And as caregivers, it's a challenge to have to physically interact and care for these people. It's interesting and it's understandable to me how the knowledge of these patients' histories affects caregivers. It's different than maybe other areas of life, social workers, it's similar. I have to touch them. I have to be right in there with them by myself alone. And for it makes sense to me that that would be really scary. You know, I'm, I'm 31 years into this now, so I've developed some ways of doing it that are helpful. Many caregivers allow it to be a complete barrier. And, you know, any early on in anybody's career, it's kind of a mental game and you pretend maybe that you don't know. And there's also theories. Um, as to should we not tell, should I not tell my coworker details that I found out about the violent issues in this, but should I not tell them? Maybe it's better if a younger, if a 25 year old physical therapist, maybe it's better if she doesn't know that thing, you know? But at first we pretend to not know. But our fear, if we are afraid, it, it shows through. And it is, we are less effective if we are perceived as fearful. People who have violent tendencies and impulsivity disorders and anger issues often have a greater instinct in sensing fear in others. So my job, I have a very simple job. My job is to get this person out of the hospital and discharged out of the facility. It's really basic. And this is very tricky because so far they have encountered law enforcement. They've encountered emergency room personnel. And those people have a very different skill set and a very different job. Thankfully, like I said, I have found ways to build rapport and trust. And I've realized over the years 
how easy it is, it's easy to access the human primal need for love. It's easy. I have to want to. I have to know that it's possible for sure. So what I do, and I'm going to read this part twice for a reason. What I do, I use my eyes. I'm specific about my touch. I present an honest lack of fear, a desire to be present in the room, meaning a sense of I want to be in this room because I've seen people who don't want to be in that room. I work to exhibit a presence that passes understanding. I find common ground with them somehow. It's different every time. Depends what common ground is, where we're from, what we like, what food we like. I use empathy and I use humor. And I allow myself to appear vulnerable in subtle ways. If I make a mistake, I talk about it. I don't try to cover it up. So let me read that again and see it with new eyes. Hear it again with the eyes of the community at large, us out there. I use my eyes, I use my touch, an honest lack of fear, a desire to be present, the kind of presence that passes understanding, going places I might not go. I find common ground, I use empathy, even when it's super hard. And I use humor. And I allow myself to make mistakes and be vulnerable in subtle ways. I don't know if I have time to share this. Um, I'm going to read you a story. When I was in Haiti, I just like this story. I, I went for a couple of weeks. There was a girl, Judeline. I'm still Facebook friends with her. She was injured in the Haiti earthquake in 2010. She lost both of her legs, different parts of her legs, and multiple other injuries, brain injury, arm injury. When I was there, she was an inpatient. She lived at the tiny hospital with no running water that I was at. Um, in the past, I've showed you pictures of her. She was. I've never seen PTSD in a human being like I saw in her. Complete trauma, completely traumatized. We couldn't even really approach her, so our goals were very basic. So my last day, my last physical therapy effort was unexpectedly amazing. This is on my last day there. We were literally saying our goodbyes, taking final pictures. One of the American doctors, who we did not even see until the last day I was there, there were no um, doctors there during that time. They're here doing surgery. They asked me to go into the operating room to see Judeline. They had done a nerve block on her hand to see if she would be able to move it. I went into the operating room and there were doctors and five other personnel around the table and a translator. So big, bright operating room. I'd seen the operating room. I'd never seen it used before because no one was there. You see, Judeline has not let anyone touch her hand since she was injured in the earthquake. Her nerves were damaged and now her hand was like a stiff wooden attachment to her body, like wood. I approached the table. She had her hand sticking up as usual. The doctor asked her to wiggle her fingers after the nerve block. And sure enough, there was a little wiggle. Then I took a risk. I knew it was a window of opportunity while she was on strong pain medicine. So I touched her hand. She was scared. I remember every second of this, every second of it. She was scared. Our eyes were locked. I struck her hand and I held it. And for several minutes, I was privileged to do something that hasn't been done in four months since the earthquake. I got to hold Judeline's hand. 
She did not like it, but I put my face by her face and I said, it's me, it's me, it's okay. It's all better. It's me, you're better. Over and over while the translator echoed my words between my words. I'm not sure the block the doctors did changed her nerve damage or gave her less pain, but I know we broke through something that day that is important because she knows that touch and love are real and that touch can be okay. And I've been continued to try to stay in touch with her. I went this morning and looked on our Facebook private message thing and I kept in contact, I had no memory of these messages, but recently I saw a picture of her and I zoomed in on her hand and her hand looks normal. Like, that's crazy to me. If you ever have seen the dog whisperer or a dog whisperer, you realize that human love is so primitive like dogs trust, human trust. And our love is so based on letting go of fear and allowing change to happen and allowing transformation. Today, we partake. Thornton Wilder ends his amazing philosophical novel, The Bridge of San Luis Rey, with this. There is a land of the living, and there's a land of the dead. The bridge is love, and it's the only way to survival. God so loved the world. So will you go through the motions today? Will my mind be right when I reach for the emblems? As you receive them, receive them more than you have. Receive the emblems as God's love. Take them in to your body as God's love. And I'm going to close with one more poem. God so loved the world. The story of Jesus Christ is this. The people of this earth waited for a Messiah, a savior. And only God would send a little baby king. The child grew and began to question things as they were. And the man moved through his days and through the world, questioning the system of kings and priests and the marketplace. He was called the new creation, the son of God. He listened who brought all, who saw, who understood. But kings and corporations and churches of this world work very hard to keep things as they are. Out into forever, amen. So they killed him. He who said, love one another. He who said, feed my sheep, for they didn't wanna share their bread and their wine. Now the story should have ended there, except that the story has always been the God of the new covenant. The good news is that in spite of our faithlessness, God is faithful. And Jesus Christ was resurrected for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. Listen, you who have ears to hear, listen, Sit down to bread and wine with strangers. Feed his sheep. Love one another. And claim new life. Amen.
All are welcome at Christ's table. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament in which we remember the life, the death, the resurrection, and continuing presence of Jesus. In the community of Christ, we also experience communion as an opportunity to renew our baptism and be formed as disciples who live Christ's mission. Others may have different or added understandings within their faith traditions. We invite all to participate in the Lord's Supper and to do so in love and peace of Jesus Christ. If you will kneel with me, I'll read the combined prayer and then we'll file out to the sides and through the center. Eternal God, we ask you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and wine to the souls of all those who receive them, that they may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and blood of your son and witness to you, O God, that they are willing to take upon them the name of your son and always remember him. and keep the commandments which he has given them, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. I can come back. I'm bringing the disciples generous response. And some of it today is from church writings on the website. Some of it is from I'm taking some things from what Jennifer said. 
and some of it is from my own experience. The first Sunday of each month, which is today, focuses on the disciples' generous response on abolish poverty and suffering, which includes oblation ministry. Today, our focus is prepare the way. Disciples of Jesus Christ work for peace and justice to make it possible to abolish poverty and end suffering in our world. So I thought about our world is our world. And I thought about my world. In my world currently, I know someone today whose sink is stopped up. They don't have a plunger. They don't have money for a plumber. I know someone today, a different person, who does not own a dishwasher. I know someone else today, different person, who cannot pay their property taxes for their house. I know somebody, a different person, who cannot afford their medications. These are just people in my world. And I know growing up in Johnson County, I didn't have that, I, I could not have said that growing up, but moving out different places, I've met different people, my world expanded. So that's just my world. And when I think of the world, it just, it, it, it becomes abolish poverty and, and suffering just becomes almost too much to think about. People give money and people give because they're asked to give. I know people are, don't carry cash much anymore, but I ask you to give if you have cash please put it in the baskets in the back, and that will help with our abolish poverty in our community. And it will help end suffering for somebody. Um, I know that people are buying gifts for people for um, um, our giving um, program that we have. That's another way to give. Um, Through our offerings, we tangibly express our gratitude to God, who is the giver of all. We share our mission of, of tithes, either by placing money in the plates or through e-tithing. And we use this time to thank God for the many, many gifts received in life. Please pray with me. God, teach us how to feed the sheep. Teach us how to love one another. Teach us how to give. I pray this, Father, in your name. Amen. Dear Lord, go with us this week and today, listening for the story, looking for love and looking for peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
save more works. Right?